Welcome to the debut episode of season three, The Leader Season. And who else to kick off the season with apart from Richard Wayne, who is the CEO of Better Homes, which is the oldest and largest brokerage in the UAE. You could just say best. The, just be best. <laughs> I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to argue. Got to keep, office, it, fair. So got to keep it. it fair. There's 12 episodes in this season <laughs> um, and everyone's going to claim to be the best. But... What does make Better Homes the best, in your opinion? Uh, God, that's straight into the, the, the difficult <laughs> what? question. No, I wasn't planning on starting <laughs> there. We were going to go into your childhood first, but let's, uh, you know. You well, look, it's the in the name, <laughs> isn't it? Better mm. Homes, the best. But look, I, I think like any business, and, you know, we're, we're, I say it with a sort of tongue-in-cheek, we strive to be the best. Let's yeah. put it that way. We constantly strive to be the best, um, and that's through our people, our training, our marketing, our recruitment. Um, and I think that's all you can do as a business, you know, strive to be the best. And you came out here in 2017 yes. from London. And actually, we've got quite a similar career background. We both started in 2000 and mm, early 2000s. Three, yeah. yeah, roughly. We both did a 10, 11 year stint at an independent. And we're going to talk about yours in a minute. And then we both did three or four years at um, a corporate. Mm hmm. And there's another coincidence. I think I've we've had this conversation, but I actually... So you got the job that I went for. Uh, this job? This job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Is, is, that, is it going to get awkward so from now on? <laughs> I'll tell you how it happened. No, no, actually, everything is meant to be as it exactly was. But I was the first person to be interviewed for that role. Um, and I think had it been, you know the 10th or 12th person to be interviewed, I might have been in with the chance, but purely based on the fact that I was the first, they couldn't make a decision on me only being the first person. Yeah. And I was under a time pressure um, to make a decision between this and the company that I ended up, which was at Driven Properties. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Um, Another great I, company. I went there and then um, I think it took another, you didn't start until October. So I was interviewed yeah, right. in May, June, and um, I started at Driven in July, and you started in October. That's right. So I think they took three months to find you. There you go, three and months. And I bet they're glad they did. <laughs> <laughs> um, who knows? You'll have to ask them. But look, I, I'm glad they did. You know, yeah. I'm very glad we yeah. uh, we came out here, and I'm glad that now we've got to know each other yes, as well. So. exactly. Okay. And um, so you started off at, the F word. There's a there's an F word. If you're a London <laughs> estate agent, you're very familiar with the F word, which is Foxton's. Yep. And you were there for a long, long time. I was there for nearly 11 years. I think it was 10 or 11 years, yeah. yeah. And just to give some context about, um, about this brand, if people don't know, if you were listing a property with Foxton's, you were going to be, you had to seriously up your game. If you knew Foxton's was opening up a branch on your high street, you knew, oh my God, well, we've got comp serious competition now. So what was life like at but, the F word? Do you know, even hearing that, that's great though, isn't it? Because actually what did Foxton's do? Probably made people up their game. Mm, it really agencies did. agencies on their toes and it kept really pushing these forward. And, and to be there at that time, so in the 2000s, pre-financial crash was and my first sort of real job after university mm. was great. I loved mm. it. You know, the, the training, the support, the leadership in there, the vision of it. Yeah. Uh, dare I say the aggression, you know. That's um, one thing I'm going to say. Y'all were so aggressive. You know, but, but I, don't, and I don't mean that in a sort of, you know, physical way, but mm -hmm. it, the, the sort of aggression of we are, I mean, it was drilled into you are the best. Yeah. We are the best. And that comes with high expectations. So the hours... The hours were brutal. Yeah. You know, looking back, it was sort of six days a week, up to 12 hours a day. Mm. Um, but 
you know, it was a, it was a, you know, everyone strives to be part of a sort of winning team. Yeah. And then I think undoubtedly at that period in the 2000s, mm. they were miles ahead of the competition. Like they really nailed the culture element, yeah. like for an internal culture. It was to a degree like a cult. <laughs> if you <laughs> if you were a fox and say they're all driving around the little minis. Um, we all had spiky hair. Spiky hair. <laughs> Long time ago now, clearly. But, <laughs> attention to detail as well. Like their their cars had to be immaculate. Yep. Their suits had to be immaculate. You'd get sent home if you had like a little bit of stubble. So, um, yeah, I mean, look, the, the world has changed, but my boss at the time had um, this is a true story. He had uh, what's it called? Um, uh, 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 cotton wool, my apologies, cotton wool in his drawer. And Why? if the cotton wool would stick to your face, uh -huh. you had to go and have a shave. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it was a different time. Yeah. Right? It was a different Brilliant. time. Now, that was pre, pre everybody in London having mm. a sort of cool beard, which yeah. everyone seems to have now. It's and I know at Foxes now, everyone seems to have a beard. So it's obviously yeah. changed for the best. And one thing that I rated them for was they never negotiated on fees. No. Nope. Ever, ever. So they were not only were they the most expensive, they always charged the most for selling fees, uh, leasing fees and property management. So where everybody else was around 12, 15%, they were always charging 17%. That's right, yeah. And um, I remember my uh, managing director at the time, he always used to say, don't tell me they reduce a fee. If, you, if one person shows me terms and conditions that says anything apart from 17%, do not believe uh, a client. If they, But it also meant that when you found a client that was already listing with Foxtons, you knew that they were going to pay top dollar. Yeah. So um, it was kind of a, a winning, winning recipe. Well, in 11 years, I think I was there, I don't think... You get so less for murder. <laughs> uh, I, I can't personally remember ever we negotiated once on a female mm. in 11 years. And, you know, that may, may have changed. But again, though, I think what a great thing for the rest of the industry in London at the time because... Mm. We all know what's happened to fees over the years. That sort of degradation of fees, the push down of fees, the race to the bottom yeah. doesn't do anybody any favours, least of all the, the client at the end mm. of the day. And that's kind of happening here now in Dubai as well. Would, would you agree? Pushing it, down fees, there's a lot of people. Not only are they pushing down fees, but there's some agents that are ready to pay the buyers a kickback if they um, purchase through them. Yeah, look, I, I, I think... That sort of thing does happen. It's not something we would ever get involved in. Mm -hmm. And the, the setup of fees in Dubai is, is fairly standardized, which actually gives brokers you know, a fairly level playing field. Um, it is 2% from a buyer. Mm -hmm. A lot of agencies do charge a, a marketing fee or a commission to the seller as well of up mm -hmm. to 2%. So I, I find it, it is... It is far more set in stone here than it is back in, in, the, in UK, the UK, where the average fee in the London is probably just around slightly above 1%, mm -hmm. I'd guess. Mm -hmm. And then after, so how did, was it difficult, quite emotional leaving Foxes? Because, um, uh, yeah, I, I had a lot of good friends there and good colleagues, and many who I'm still friends with, and many have actually gone off to do other things around the industry um, and gone on to bigger and better and great things um i was there for 11 years straight mm. out of school so it took a it took it took a, a little bit of emotional yeah. separation yeah but um i only think back with fondness mm. uh but i'm you know i'm glad i moved on mm. to other things as well and you went straight from university to there were no kind of in-between uh, jobs it was a week i left wow. university uh, kind of mid-june mm -hmm. And I went back to my parents' house on the Monday morning and there was a newspaper. It was back in the days of newspapers, this. So it was at the back of a newspaper advert. I think it was a picture of a guy on a snowboard saying, come and sell houses in London, mm -hmm. OTE, something crazy, like £80,000 a year, which is obviously a bit yeah, high in the yeah. sky at the time. Um, and I interviewed on the Tuesday had a second interview on the Thursday, and mm. I started the following Monday. Right. So within a week of leaving you university, were, were, I, had a, I had a new suit from Next, yeah. and I had a horrible, <laughs> horrible tie on. Yeah. I still got the picture, you know, mm. sort of spiky hair, horrible suit, horrible when tie. When you had hair. When I had hair, yeah. yeah. So that was Did you leave Foxes with no hair, or was that yeah, later I, on? Yeah, I mean, move? we're going off topic, but um, <laughs> I'd, I'd lost my hair a long time before I left Foxes. Um, and funnily enough, back to the F word, I had also applied for a role at, um, at Foxton's, but I didn't get it. Crikey, it sounds like I should give you some interview <laughs> techniques. Shall I tell you why <laughs> I didn't get it? Because again, with, with them, you had to jump through so many hoops. And the first hoop was the telephone call. Yep. And I'd gone out the night before 
I wasn't expecting the call, but they called me at nine o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So I answered the phone, hello. And they were like, no, you've not made it. To this. She's not up. Really? She's not ready to go. She's not getting past um, stage one interview. No, it was, it was, uh, it was actually, it was a great interview. You know, they had the quite, it was quite an intense phone call. Mm. If you remember a quick clue, you remember. I didn't get past. I didn't got, get far. Then you went to like a, a group meeting where <laughs> yeah. you all turn up, there's about 30 people in a room. They, they test you, you, don't they? They that. test you, they offer you a beer. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we used to say, because I was I was involved in recruitment for many years with Foxons, and they say, is the beer a test? If you mm-hmm. have a beer, you fail. I was is like, it? No, no, it's not. It was, oh. No, it's just there if you want one and have okay. a drink and relax. Oh, and they sort that of was, see that's, a, that's a, like an old myth then. Yeah, so okay. I'll blow that myth apart. Mm-hmm. And then, you, you, you know, it was, it was a little bit like uh, speed dating. You get taken into a room, you've got 10 minutes with the director and, and uh, off you go. Mm-hmm. So there you go. Um, and then you went on to your move. Yep, where you, an LSL. You were um, an LSL, um, which was, I mean, LSL was in the business of acquiring Correct, yeah. smaller businesses and we'll talk about if that's the future for Dubai because right now there's so many new real estate companies opening up there's some top agents going off and and, and deciding to open up their own brokerages um, and even I think one of your when you came to Dubai you acquired um, a couple of yeah. real yeah, estate so let's talk about in. acquisitions in in the region and in general okay uh, so my, when I was at LSL, I, uh, I sort of fell into acquisitions. So I spent about 18 months um, more on the integration side of acquisitions. Mm-hmm. But it was great fun. Uh, got out of London and saw re- what real estate estate agent was like up and down the country. And, you know, that's been the sort of... That's been really what the UK has been all about, consolidation, yeah. particularly consolidation of rental books and property management yes. books over the last sort of five, six, seven years, I mm-hmm. guess. Will that happen is a really interesting question. So when we first came in, or when I arrived back in 2017, I'd come from this sort of multi-branded approach, and I thought something like that could really work over here. Because um, different brands gives choice fundamentally, gives choice to customers, also can give choice to brokers and mm-hmm. a different you know, a different platform for brokers to work on. And at the time, the market was very different. So mm. at the time, the market was tough. You know, 2018... 17, 18, most of 19 was tough, mm-hmm. as you'll, you'll remember. And there was a lot of the small independent brokerages over here that had opened during the boom. You know, mm-hmm. people need to remember history when they think about yeah. the future. Um, who had opened, they'd, they'd sort of over leveraged on cost. And frankly, you know, every week there was one going bust. Yeah. And we we took a couple of opportunities. We found an, a brand called Ascot & Co. Mm-hmm. We really liked the two guys that ran it, uh, Ben and Dan. We really liked the brand. There was a few brokers left in it. We really liked them. And we thought that was an opportunity to try something different. Mm-hmm. And we acquired Ascot & Co. back in 2018, I think it was. And, and that business is still part of our sort of wider groups. So it's mm-hmm. not directly Better Homes, but it's part of our wider groups that have been rebranded to Living Ascot. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, there are those opportunities. Um, but I suspect you know, it'll take the market to tighten up a little bit yeah. for us to really see consolidation here. And and in the UK, it's slightly different because you're, you're, like you said, you're buying the rental book. Correct, yeah. So a company is valued based on its property management <clears throat> recurring income. Whereas if you don't have a property management company or you're, you know, you're, if you're acquiring a real estate company here, you're just acquiring what assets do they have? Their top performers, the management team, if they stay, that is. Exactly. Um, so you're buying transient assets, which yeah. are people, right? Which is risky. Very risky, very risky. And I think that's why actually good businesses with uh, tangible assets, assignable contracts like mm-hmm. uh, a rental book, are still have the value. And where we have seen in the last sort of two years, some consolidation has been around that. So yeah. Provis, for example, coming in and purchasing mm-hmm. Estico and other such brands where there's a bit more to them than yeah. just we've got a couple of good brokers. Mm-hmm. And actually, the, the, that's where the value is. Yeah. So would your advice be to anybody kind of in, well, any real estate CEO or anyone that's thinking about it is you've got to have property management as well or? Yeah, look, I think property management adds that sort of tangible value. Mm-hmm. Um but I think, you know, I, I'm always a believer of a, a CEO or a business owner should run a business to run the best business they possibly can. And then if an opportunity comes along to exit take at the it. right time, take it. Yeah. I, I always worry when people are like, I'm running a business to exit because mm-hmm. I don't know if that always leads to the best choices. Yeah, you've got to think about the customer first or, exactly. you know, yeah, or solving the problem. Yeah, exactly. Make mm-hmm. the business the best possible business you can be. Mm-hmm. But to answer your question, yeah, I think um, if tangible value... Um, 
it's very risky and very dangerous to start buying, acquiring real estate brokers just for the brokers in them yeah. for obvious reasons. And we've seen it time and time again, you know, mm. not to mention names, but uh, there's a very, very successful luxury brokerage at the moment oh, who had, you know, who, who did one great acquisition, fantastic, mm. and the timing was perfect mm. of their key competitor and it couldn't have been better. But if you look at the history of that business, they'd also bought four or five other brokerage over the sort of four or five years before that, mm. which hadn't necessarily gone to plan. Yeah. So, uh, and I guess that's a story of perseverance yeah. and, and, and if it doesn't work first time, get it right the next. Yeah. But I, I think um, at the moment, as I say, acquisition over here, I think we will see the market tighten at some point. Nothing lasts forever. Mm -hmm. And I think at that point, yeah, there will be opportunity. And are you looking out for opportunities now? Always. Mm -hmm. You know, we've opened oh, a number of businesses over the last few years, mm -hmm. and some of it has been opportunistic. The Ascot thing was opportunistic. Yeah. We took in a couple of brokerages, um, and we just assimilated them into ours rather than keeping mm. the brand. I like the um, Linda's idea. Linda's... Um, yeah, Linda's real estate. The, it's the mums of yeah. real estate. Really Again, this is slightly my other hat. So it's the Better Homes <laughs> hat, and then we've got our, our parent company, Senko. But So Linda's real estate wasn't an acquisition. We That was a greenfield. We set that up. Okay. Um, and we set it up. Uh, we set it up in the summer of COVID, mm -hmm. like all great businesses were set up. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. Uh, we thought, yeah, let's set up a new company when everything else was shutting down. Um, but it was, it, it was the story behind it is Linda Mahoney who established Better Homes in 1986. In 1986, yeah. as a single mum, mm. and that's what most people don't know about Linda's story. You know, she was mm. a single mother here in uh, the Middle East with yeah. two kids. Uh, she needed to financially support herself. She was a nurse, right? She'd originally been a nurse. Yeah. Um, she'd worked for six months, I think it was, for a friend of hers in a leasing agency. Mm -hmm. That friend then decided to leave, so mm -hmm. she was sort of back to square one. And she thought, do you know what? I'm going to open my own. Yeah. And she grew that uh, to be the you know the biggest real estate brokerage in in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. um, so it, an amazing story. The sort of story I don't think everyone always associates with the, this part of the world. Um, and you know, you take that backstory, which had always inspired me when I came into the company. And then my my own wife, who's a working mum, mm. we've got three kids and she was getting back into the job market after that. And I sort of saw the, the some of the trials and tribulations that mm. she was going through. And we thought to ourselves, myself and Linda and a few others thought to ourselves, look, there's such a rich um, uh, talent pool mm -hmm. out there mm -hmm. of, of, of mums uh, and ladies in this situation who have... Incredible networks, as you yeah. say. Yeah. You know, they've got the networks that, frankly, some kid off the boat does not have. Right. He's straight off a plane. They yeah. do not have. The school uh, run network they, the school run, and, and, is and, and so valuable. We used to say the, the story at the school gates. Mm -hmm. And crucially, they've got the life skills and they've got the life experience that I think resonates with the majority of our clients. Yeah. And you put all that together, and now we've got a great team. It's about 35 wow. brokers in that company. They're going to go into their new office soon. And uh, yeah, So just to, be, just to draw a picture of it, it's kind of, they're all not part, would you call them part-time? No, they're full-time. Full-time, Yeah, okay. it, and you know, this isn't a part-time mm -hmm. business, right? Mm -hmm. It's not something you can do part-time. But it's certainly, the company itself is set up and run by working mums. Mm -hmm. And I think that itself gives it an understanding mm -hmm. of, um, you know, what it takes to be a successful working mother yeah. in, in any environment. So it is full time. Mm. Uh, there's an understanding around the business that our families are, are, as, are as important yeah. to us as our So a little our, bit more flexibility. Yeah, I, mm. I, 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 you can hear I'm sort of pulling back. <laughs> I, I slightly worry around the words like flexibility yeah. and part time because it's not. And if you mm. ask the ladies in there, uh, Sylvie, they work as hard as anybody. Mm -hmm. They're as dedicated as anybody. Um, but, you know, at the same mm -hmm. time, they work in a slightly different way to some of our other companies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that leads us on nicely to networking because yeah. it's, you know, Linda's was formed out of, you know, well, tapping into these existing networks, the school run, the community clubs, yeah. the, and even villa communities. You, you've always got like a WhatsApp group in a particular villa community, the mums group and so on. So they know what's going on. They know all the hot gossip. They know who's divorcing who and whose yeah. property might be coming up for sale pretty soon. So um, what would your kind of networking advice be for a newbie agent, should we say? I, I think um, know what your network is, mm. really. So for the Linda's point of view, or for most of our brokers, they are what we term community brokers. Um, a lot of them 
you know, have a patch and they work that patch. For the Linders guys, they live on the patch, right? Mm. So they live on it, their kids go to school in it, and that is their network. So focus on on that patch. Um, some of the guys network very, very well in um, sort of uh, in groups, nationality-based groups, yeah. that sort of thing. So I think, I think like anything in Dubai real estate, it's important to focus and not get have a too... Niche. Yeah, have a bit of a focus. Have yeah. it because it is a big city. It's a big marketplace. Mm-hmm. I think the mistake that a lot of new brokers go is they they don't have a focus and they start mm-hmm. chasing things left, right, and center. They're mm-hmm. just you know like dogs chasing after vans going up yeah. and down the Sheikh Zayed Road. They they are very busy, but they're mm-hmm. not getting a lot done. Mm-hmm. And um, I'll take it back to your. You did a degree in law and criminology. Oh, cracky bin. I've done reading, my research. Reading it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did, yeah. So you clearly didn't grow up wanting to be in the real estate industry. Um, what did I grow up? What were you? What What did you want to be when you grew up? So I uh, there was a TV program in the UK at the time called Cavanagh QC. I'm yes, not sure I, I remember, remember it. Yeah. yeah. So I did remember watching that, going, "Oh, I'm going to be a barrister," mm-hmm. uh, and I ended up being. And actually, also at the time, I thought maybe I'd be a copper. Mm-hmm. So there, you can see where I the law. Could see that. Yeah, I could yeah, see yeah. That. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's uh, that's where the law criminology mm-hmm. came from, um, and but I'd always done sales. So I I you know I going back to when I was at school, I had a lot of evening jobs and a lot of them around sales. And when I was at university, I actually my first ever sort of real sales job was timeshare. Okay, uh, so I was we on all the did phones. That. I did window um, wind double glazing. Door uh, yeah, to door. exactly. Yeah. So I, I did a lot of work on the phones. And then when I was first at Foxtons, well, my my role at Foxtons was primarily winning listings and closing listings and closing on fee. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So actually, a lot of the hard sell stuff, I guess, yeah. was us, and it was over the over the telephone. So that was kind of my 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 formative years. Mm-hmm. Um, so no, I probably never went. At 16, that's what I want to do in my mm. life. But I kind of, as I say, I fell into it. I saw that advert mm. straight after uni. I knew I didn't want to do law, mm. that, to be clear. Yeah. I, I knew after four years of studying law, I didn't want to go into law. Uh, I wanted to do something where I was mm. meeting people and talking to mm. people. And um, I thought I'd do a state agency for a year. And it was five years and, and then 10, 10 years, years and, and then 20 years. And, uh, and then parole. Uh, yeah, and look, I, I love it. Mm. You know, I fundamentally, I love the industry. I love the people. Yeah. I love dealing with clients. I, I, it's funny, whenever I interview everyone goes, I'm passionate about property. Mm. I've never been that passionate mm. about property. I've always been more passionate about people yeah. um, r- rather than the property necessarily. So mm. look, I love a nice home, don't get me wrong. Yeah. But uh, um, so, yeah, whilst I probably never... At 15, was never thinking I was going to be a state agent. It's worked well for me. I yeah. enjoy it. And I, I guess as in some way, having a degree in law and criminology has has to have had some kind of impact on you being a leader. Okay. There must be some elements of law, order, fairness that's carried through into your current role. I've never thought of it like that, but mm. maybe. Yeah, maybe. Uh, the criminology bit helps sometimes yeah. as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the law bit helps occasionally with files and contract work mm-hmm. and all the rest of it. But I think, you know, I, I do think leaders need to be fair and I do think leaders need to be consistent. So, yeah, maybe. maybe okay. it's, uh, um, your biggest regret? Um, this sounds so cliched, but it's honestly true. I wish I'd moved to Dubai sooner, sooner yeah. and got involved sooner. I got offered a role uh, many, many, many years ago at Smith & Ken. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, who's still a very good friend of mine, who's in, in mortgages here at the minute, um, put me in front of the guys at Smith and Ken, probably in 2006 or 2007. And I sometimes wonder to myself, you know, what could we have what done if, we, if ha- we'd well, have been we there? Have but ended hey, up, uh, yeah, everything happens for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. You know, yeah. Sylvia didn't take the job. Exactly. Better, so you were able to. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So we've kind of gone through your past let's talk more about the present and your you know we'll do the future towards the end um but like right now kind of what's what is a day in the life of rick waned what Uh, do you are you part of that like 5 a.m club do you have any rituals or Uh, routines I am 525. Okay. I'm the 525 club, club right? which is pretty early because mm-hmm. I was never a morning guy. You know, mm-hmm. I was very much a sort of night owl, which is weird because I'm totally the other way around. Yeah. I, if it gets past half nine, I think I'll turn into a pumpkin yeah. and I can't stay out. So, <laughs> I, so yeah, I'm up at about 
525. I know it doesn't always look like it, but I've been at the gym three days a week, um, which kind of keeps me maintained because I do like my food and I like, and also, you know, you go back to your point about networking, Mm. you're forever being taken to lunch or dinner, all the rest of it. So so I'm up, uh, and when I'm not doing my three days of the gym, I'm up with the kids and I do drop offs. So Mm. I try and do school drop offs on on two days a week. Um, And then it's really into the businesses Mm. and We've got a number of businesses. The biggest and my main focus is better homes. Mm-hmm. Tend to try and do a morning meeting. So most mornings I'm trying to get in front of some of the brokers. With the whole team or just no, the managers? No, it'll, mm-hmm. it'll be depending on who, which, what day of the week, but it'll be team focused. Mm-hmm. We get the whole team together on a monthly basis and then I get all of the companies together on a quarterly basis. Yeah, gosh, which so, venue? How much uh, to, you be, to be honest, I shouldn't drop too many names, but maybe I'll get a, a free dinner next time I go in. But Phillies Fog is yeah. tends to be our, our go to place yeah. to get everyone together because we can get sort of three fifty, four hundred people True. in a room and they've mm-hmm. got a big screen. So that's always really good fun and I really enjoy doing that. Mm-hmm. Um but the, you know general day day to day is as you'd expect, I am mainly on the sort of uh, internal people side rather than mm. out there meeting clients but I do like still to get out meet clients mm. try and bring business into the company so it's varied I know that again it's a bit of a cliche mm. but it's no days no the two same. days are the same and some days I get to spend time with people like yourself yeah, and, and yeah. do this sort of thing and what kind of mentor would you say you are how would your management team describe you oh god uh, <clears throat> what a horrible question to try and answer <laughs> These are the sort of questions that always make my uh, toes <laughs> curl slightly, uh, and you'd have to ask them. I'll ask them. What then. kind of? I don't know. I think. I think. Hopefully, they think I'm fairly fair. Mm-hmm. Do they always agree with everything I say? Probably yeah. not. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, that, I'm not here for everyone to always agree with me. But I think. I hope they think fair. Um, I come in with a most days with a smile on my face and mm. I hope everyone else around you comes in with a smile on your face because mm. we're very, very privileged to have these jobs mm. and I fully, fully believe that and I think, um, you know, you, we should be positive and, and take mm. that on to dealing with our customers and yeah. our clients. And you're known, I mean, Better Homes is known for having a lot of exclusive projects uh, yeah. and I think one thing that people under or agencies underestimate or agents underestimate is the amount of work that goes in to winning an exclusive project. Mm. And nine times out of 10, it actually starts with property management. You've got the property management relationship with yep. that client. Then eventually it will lead into an exclusive sales so Correct. you've got how many properties under management now ballpark let's oh, say. seven thousand seven in 000. here in abu dhabi in yeah. charge yeah okay so your exclusive projects is that the winning formula it's certainly one absolutely mm. so we've got a couple that should be coming to the market end of q1 start of q2 mm. um, and two of them are from well-known families within dubai who we've been doing property management for for five years to a decade yeah. and and both of these families we've worked with for many, many years and are, are entering the market with off-plan projects coming up. And they're exactly that. You know, yeah. We've got the relationship with them. We've been working with them on these projects in terms of pricing and advisory mm. for the last 12 months, 18 yeah. months, yeah. Uh, if not longer. And hopefully now we're just at that point of mm. launching. Um, but some of, them, so some of the projects we have are uh, brought to us by brand some of it through our brokers as well mm-hmm. you know the broker network out yeah. there dealing with people sell some land that land can transpire into mm-hmm. a, a project and you've got the the luxury segment as well covered by prime yes that brand Tell yeah, us so, about prime so we launched prime in 2022 um and it, look the, the real estate market in dubai it's all luxury it's all luxury right <laughs> yeah. and it, yeah, of course it's not there's a big market here mm. and there's there's a big sort of middle segment that yeah. we're very very strong in but that luxury segment i think has really captured the imagination captured mm. the eyes of the world over the last two or mm. three years and we felt that we needed to offer something to the clientele in that space that mm. is a little bit more than our our, our standard and we wanted to offer something to brokers within that space mm-hmm. as well there's a little bit more than our our standard mm-hmm. and uh, so we launched prime 
Um, we launched Prime and we launched a competition alongside it called Dubai's Top 50 Homes. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, uh, I saw that. Yeah. You know, which was mm-hmm. great fun last year. It's mm-hmm. about to launch for a second year, so we're going to go again this year. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was a really nice way to get the brand out there, really nice way to get ourselves in front of some people with some luxury homes mm-hmm. and win some listings. So we got some really great listings out of that. And nice strategy. It yeah. was all right, wasn't it, that one? <laughs> that was well thought through. So it was really good fun. It was a nice piece of branding. Got us some really good listings, which turned into some great sales. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so onwards and upwards. We brought in a guy called Louis Harding, who's the MD. Yeah. Also he, X F word. He's also X Foxes, <laughs> but he was the last six years he was running Strutt and Parker in London. Yeah. So Just that is all a heritage luxury, brand. Right? Yeah. A heritage brand. I mean, I think, mm-hmm. I think their minimum sales about four million or something yeah. crazy like that. So he comes from that luxury world, and I think he adds real credibility now to Prime mm-hmm. and what they're doing in Prime, and he's really going to be pushing that forward mm-hmm. this year. Because it, I mean, you think it's the same. Same role, listing, selling, but you're dealing with a different, there's different psychologies perhaps involved when it comes to luxury. We're talking about a lot more money. We're talking about a different type of clientele, different expectation on both sides, the sellers and the buyers. So what's been your experience when it comes to dealing with luxury? So I think uh, I think it's really, it's more about relationship and it's more about collaborative working together. You know, the, the luxury real estate world be it here, New York mm-hmm. or London, it really is about, you know, the, the little black books and then collaborative approach. So the prime guys, they work together, there's a team of them, they work with our other mm-hmm. networks, but they're also out there working with great brokerages in mm-hmm. other uh, companies yeah. across the bar. And I think that's the key to getting it right. It's relationships. Being open, and, but open to collaboration mm-hmm. within that space. Mm-hmm. And obviously it goes without saying, you know, exceptional marketing and all the rest of it that goes mm-hmm. behind it. But I think it's that collaborative approach is more important Mm. in that luxury space. Speaking of exceptional marketing, there's one thing I'll give better homes. And that is, so I mean, I've been in Dubai now for seven years and I've moved three times. And in that move, I've had to register with, let's say over a hundred agencies. And there is only one agency that continues to email me to this day and that's better homes. There you go. Now, I don't know if that's a British thing, email marketing, <laughs> but of all the companies that have got my email address, only you're using it. Good, good. I mean, look, it's good to hear. I actually think, you know, there's less and less impact from emails, as we all know. My own email address is anyone emails who currently goes into the... No, but I disagree. I think, like... If I were to get a WhatsApp from an, a, comp- a real estate company, it would feel like it's a encroaching on my personal okay, space much. but when you're in an, when you're reading your emails you're more open to being approached about new projects and you know that these emails aren't all relevant to me but it's brand recognition i'm constantly reminded of you guys i'm constantly aware of anything that's going on in your company i can't say the same for anybody else and i'm in the real estate industry so i'm aware anyway but for you know jamera jane she, she got an email for i just think like, why is nobody? I mean, maybe I, I, we should keep quiet. Maybe don't. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> the, the lost art of emails. Mm. Look, I think. Uh, look, I, I agree with you. I, I prefer personally. I actually prefer a WhatsApp. Mm-hmm. But that's you know me, me personally, and I also prefer the off ramp, which is phone stop call. WhatsApp. App, uh, yeah, oh. The phone call, but stop at WhatsApp and me for a period of time. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm not currently interested. And I think that whole marketing space, things like AI coming in the future, will probably evolve an awful lot. Mm. But I think it is important. You know, emails are pretty easy to keep you involved yeah. and keep you engaged in and mm. it seems to be working yeah. so well. and actually you know the same way we look at a business being valued on its uh, property management portfolio size for example um, a lot of kind of content creators or any kind of any new businesses are now focused more and more on collecting and using email addresses yeah. because they know how easy it is for their social media to get hacked or for them to lose all of their followers or to get shadow banned for any reason. So the only real value a content creator or you know someone like me would have is the email addresses that I get. That's it. So just my signups or registrations, but followers, um, you know, subscribers, all of that can go just like yeah. that. So. 
Yeah. We've got, I think we've got 600,000 contacts in the in the database. I was going to ask. We've been here a <laughs> while, you know. To, you must be up to a million or so now. I think but. it's, yeah, I mean, it's many, many, but if you take mm. the sort of, um, we, we've got about 600,000 active. Yeah. Um, that haven't thousands. unsubscribed yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, over, no, that's really uh, good. Years, yeah. And so that must make selling or launching anything new way more impactful when you're when you've got that number of email addresses because these people aren't necessarily following you on instagram or you know social media so um, i'm just going to champion email marketing email marketing also a phone call occasionally and a phone call occasionally (laughs) well they're getting phone calls i'd say anyone in dubai that owns a property is not short of phone calls right and um we were you know we were raised in UK real estate to letter drop, to yep. cold call, to door knock, Correct. you know, all these kind of undesirable approaches. Um, but here it's now made illegal. You know, you risk getting a fine. People still do it, obviously. Um, but it's the volume of phone calls. So maybe to differentiate yourself, go back to email marketing as, you know, not as invasive. Right. Let's talk about staying on marketing social media okay what would your what's your, what kind of content makes you cringe when you <laughs> when you're flipping through your instagram or you are you uh, on tiktok no i'm not on okay. tiktok he's the on instagram the marketing key team keeps sort of threatening me with a tiktok account oh <laughs> uh but thus far i've i've avoided that now i'm, I'm on instagram what's your handle at it's at rick wayne yeah uh, I've got that's my work one. I've got a family one with the, the kids on there, but mm-hmm. yeah, it's at Rick Wayne. Um, I like Instagram. I think it's I, I, I kind of do it for a little bit and then come out of it, do mm-hmm. it for a little bit, come out. So I'm not very consistent if, yeah. I'm, if I'm honest. I should be more so. Uh, I'm a sort of late adopter, I think. If I'm you know if yeah. I'm honest, probably again because I was coming yeah. from the UK and you know we were drilled. Wasn't, yeah, it wasn't that big back when I certainly you know I mean. When did Facebook launch? In 2007, 2007 or so, yeah. you know, didn't even exist. Well, mm. I still remember getting the newspapers and circling the <laughs> circling the properties in the back of the yeah. paper. Um, but I think it's great, and I think some people leverage it incredibly well. Mm-hmm. What makes my toes curl? Yeah. Um, you know, not mentioning any names, but people sat on the bonnets of very expensive cars okay. telling people to be humble. Mm-hmm. Those sort of things, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, those sort of things make me roll my eye and mm-hmm. I see too much of it. It's frankly. a shame because we were nearly about to um, shoot this episode in the back of your my, Bentley, my, but yeah. it's in for a service. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, Bentley's, the Bentley's getting a service, that's right. Now, I think I, I, I'm all for people making money and doing well, but mm-hmm. to be very, very clear on it, but I don't know if you don't need to sit in the bonnet of your car telling mm-hmm. everyone to, to to be humble but um i think i think really good content that educates people mm-hmm. entertains people is, is great mm-hmm. uh, edutainment i've coined it okay and you as a ceo how do you keep your knowledge fresh how do you keep your finger on the pulse when it comes to the industry and education and edutainment edutainment um i think i think by being in there with the team being out there with clients as much as I possibly can because there's no um, there's no better way to know what's going on in the market than being in the market. I think that's yeah. that's really important. A lot of our leaders in the business are still transacting, still doing business. Mm-hmm. And again, that keeps them fresh. Um, I can see what you're asking. Who do I listen to? Who do I sort of follow? Yourself, clearly. Do you? Yeah. Oh, I'm so honoured. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think, you know, I, I actually... Well, let's plug my uh, podcast. Absolutely. Of course, you're already on it, so you know, Golden Nuggets with Sylvia Aldao, but I want to know what your favourite episode was. Uh, After this one? Yeah. (laughs) Before this one. (laughs) Don't don't, don't ask me that. (laughs) Just give us a uh, guess. Oh, I'll give you a guess. You haven't watched any (laughs) of my podcasts, have you? (laughs) Not yet. I'm, right. I'm more of a. I'm more of a sort of. You uh, like the reels, don't you? I do like a yeah, reel. Yeah. I do like a reel. I tell, I, on, to honestly answer though, um, I'm a bit. I'm a bit sort of old school. I genuinely. Every day I get my Bloomberg update, so mm-hmm. I get emailed. Oh, by, so you paid for Bloomberg? Yeah, it's not yeah, a lot good. of money. So yeah. I get I get a little email from Bloomberg every day telling me what's happening in the property in the market. Mm-hmm. I try and genuinely, I try and I try and make my own opinion about things mm-hmm. by reading what's happening out there rather than just ingesting mm-hmm. 
other influencers' yeah. uh, opinions, rightly or wrongly? Mm -hmm. One thing that I was always kind of taught as a leader was people respect what you inspect. Yep. So I used to perhaps look at certain KPIs that nobody would typically look at. So I'd like to know from you, is there any particular KPI, forget, like putting sales numbers to the yeah. side or, or, or an agent's kind of sales uh, performance, what else are you looking for in terms of KPIs? The, the big one for us, and we're sort of in the middle of building this infrastructure around it, is you know general NPS scoring of our brokers. Mm -hmm. So looking at various What's different... NPS and, uh, Net promoter score. Oh, but NPS, yeah, yeah. NPS, mm -hmm. my apologies. Mm -hmm. so, but, but in general, looking at what is the customer experience and what's the customer satisfaction from a broker level. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of things you can look at. Uh, speed, speed of response, which mm. I know the portals track as well, but yeah. we're now tracking internally, quality of listings, um, and then feedback from, from our customers. Yeah. So we've built in now, you know, go back to our emails, mm -hmm. we can email, but we also WhatsApp and we're building an app yeah. that will give us real-time feedback from our our brokers. Because I think brokers, actually, so. cause our, I'll give a shout out to Charlie, Charlie Bathrell. Anna. In down in Marina Letters. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, Charlie, good guy. He, uh, oh, bless him. He, he, I gave him a bit of a, <laughs> I was a bit of a difficult customer to deal with. One of those that kind of doesn't quite, because I ended up, I was looking with him at Marina and I ended up in DIFC. Uh, so okay. I am one of those annoying clients, but he was so patient and he was on the ball, even afterwards checking up everything's gone okay with um, um, with my property. So I'd say that's testament to you guys and, and your Good. training and your, maybe what you're inspecting yeah. might encourage them to do that follow-up. You know, maybe yeah. if you weren't looking at but I think, I think look, we, we, can, we can track it and we can test it, but it's also about understanding from their side. So, mm. you know, Charlie, for example, now you might not have done the deal with him, which is frustrating mm. yeah. for Charlie if you spend time, yeah. but, you know, you have a voice and mm. you're using that voice Shout now. Shout out to Charlie. What's the sign name again? Uh, Banner, I think. Charlie Banner, Better Homes, Marina, if you're looking at buying or renting in Marina, give him a shout. He, um, you know, but you're... We often say, don't we, if, if you've had bad experience, you'll tell 10 people you've yeah. had a good experience, tell one or whatever. Yeah. Well, whatever. we've just told thousands. So, we've just told thousands, <laughs> but, but, but that's, that's mm. what it should be about. Mm. It should actually be about, we're in, we're in a city of referral. Yeah. Far more than probably any of our home countries where we've come from. Mm -hmm. This is a city where 95% of us have all moved here. Mm -hmm. we're, all being, we're all looking for somebody to help guide us. Yeah. And that asking for referral, asking who did you use, yeah. who do you recommend is really important here. Yeah. So... You know, hopefully they understand that rather than we just, it's because we're, mm. we're tracking it. So that's good. I, I thought you were going to say something like our uh, number of listings or number of calls or whatever. But Look, yeah, we, that's we, a really good All of that track. we track, of yeah. course. Yeah, they've all got KPIs around mm. listings, called, you know, KPIs about viewing numbers, price reduction numbers, all those sort of key elements to getting the job done. But I think the real thing for us is that, that, that customer journey, that customer experience. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, right. So my tagline or one of my taglines is um, get started, get noticed, get results, get referred. So this is what I want to help people do yep. in the real estate industry. So if you could give me your words of wisdom to anyone getting started, what would it be? Uh, work hard, work harder than the person next to you and focus. Okay. Getting noticed. Can you say getting noticed for the right things rather yeah, than the wrong? Yeah. Don't don't go and sit on somebody else's car telling you to other people to be humble. <laughs> um, I think do do the right thing. Be honest. Um, don't be afraid to ask for business as well. Don't be afraid to ask for referrals. Um, and again, that focus. Make sure you're focused and getting noticed in one core area of the market. In the correct niche. Okay. Yeah. Getting uh, results. Ew. I mean, nothing beats hard work. Um, make sure you learn from those around you. Be a sponge. Make sure, you know, you're listening and mm. learning and, uh, and putting it into practice. But again, it's so, it's so sort of cliched and boring, but mm. hard work. Okay. And the last one is how to get referred. Uh, do the best you possibly can. Be like Charlie. Mm -hmm. Be memorable. Yeah. And even if you don't get the business there and then, you know, make sure somebody yeah. remembers you and asks for it. Yeah. You know, with a big smile on your face, ask, because if you don't ask, you won't get. Yeah, absolutely. So, 
Lots of British agents. Oh, I wonder why. Better hands. You, Louis. <laughs> um, are you still hiring? Yeah, we're always hiring. We're looking yeah. to grow. I mean, Dubai has grown so much in the last three or four years that, you know, frankly, there's lots of new communities out there that we need We need brokers and we need coverage in. So, mm-hmm. yeah, we, we are hiring. Still from the UK? Look, we, we hire, we're really diverse. So I think there's 42 nationalities in terms of our brokers. Mm-hmm. Um, but we do hire Brits. We hire... Um, estate agents, salespeople from, mm. from overseas coming in. Um, we've got a number of British managers, as you said, yeah. myself and Louis. We have other nationalities in terms of managers, mm. Italian, mm-hmm. uh, Lebanese, um, you know, all, all, from all over. But I think there is, there's quite a, a well-trodden path from UK estate agency into Dubai, Dubai yeah. real estate. So, you know, mm-hmm. obviously we, we, we tap into that as well. And that was, as you said, it was your biggest regret is not coming out here sooner. Correct. So what would you be te- what would you be saying to someone in the UK or Europe real estate industry right now? I think, look, I, I think um, it, w- the first question is why do, why do people sort of want to take estate agents from other parts of the world over mm-hmm. here? Because if you can bring that experience and you can bring that knowledge and bring mm-hmm. it to bear into this market, you can be incredibly successful yeah. and you can sort of 5x, 10x your earning potential mm-hmm. um, because fees are, fees are good. Yeah. It's obviously tax-free and mm-hmm. all the rest of it. But I think the, the, the market here is just a world away from mm-hmm. where the market is in a lot of these countries yeah. at the moment. And I think the next five to ten years of the market here will be a, a period of growth, albeit, mm-hmm. you know, not just linear, mm-hmm. but I think anyone coming over to this market now with a view to really capitalise in the next five to ten years will have an incredible mm-hmm. time. And I think as well, because there is so much competition in the UAE in terms of real estate agents, the bar is quite low. The bar is set quite low. So even if you're an agent with six months experience, you're probably better than some of the agents out here that have got three or four years experience. Would you agree? Well, look, I, I think a really good estate agent or broker from another part of the world who is experienced mm. um, can bring that knowledge and experience to bear here will do well. I mean, the, the difference between selling houses in London, New York, Paris to selling houses here the the, di- the differences are less than the similarities, true, right? True. You know, still four walls, a roof, the same mm. hopes and dreams of mm. a buyer and seller anywhere in the world. Of course, the, the process is a little bit different here. But a lot easier here. In many ways, yeah. it's a lot easier. Mm. It's actually a lot quicker yeah. over here. Um, so I, I think, you know, really, if you are doing, if you're selling properties in a city at the moment where the average fee is 1%, mm-hmm. it's cold and dark for most of the day, you're paying quite high taxes, and you know you're not earning that much money out mm. of it, but you're good. Then I think you'd be crazy not to consider. Mm. And I look now at this sort of self-employed model in the UK. Yeah. And if you're going to do that, mm. you might as well and, just come like, here. Go and do it in a place where you could, where there's real value in yeah. it. Yeah. You know. Absolutely, because um, and I was with Christopher Watkin. You know him, of course. Um, and there's only actually a thousand of self-employed agents in the UK okay. compared to here where everyone is technically 14,000 technically self-employed but under a brokerage mm-hmm. um, okay apart from the droves of agents coming over from the UK and Europe is there anything else that you'd like to see inspired by London or your UK real estate experience that you'd like to see here in the UAE? I, th- I think the one thing over here that the city and the, the market would really um, benefit from would be more exclusivity in the market. Yeah. So exclusivity, a, an exclusivity yeah. that you can rely on, I guess, is the best best mm-hmm. way to put it. So if there is an exclusive mandate, if that mandate is then broken, a really simple and quick and effective way to then address that mm-hmm. um, from a legal standpoint. And I think that's, it, yeah. yeah, an enforcement of, of that. So mm-hmm. I think the deal did Rira do a great job. Um, and there's a sort of, it, we are seeing that shift. We're seeing that shift towards exclusivity. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. exclusivity gives customers confidence. It gives brokerages confidence to invest and really yeah. put their time and effort into something. And I think is, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, it clears the messaging for the end user as well. So I think it would be a good thing. And it, you know, it, it does get complicated when you list with multiple agents because there is that element of you might think that there's more interest by giving your property to multiple agents, 
but actually they might all be calling you with offers from the same buyer. Correct, yeah. You know? So you think that there's demand being created, but actually you're just making life more difficult well, for I, th- I think when you put a property on the market with three or four agents, you're actually inviting lower offers. Mm. You know, you can see, people see that, okay, there's an opportunity here for me almost to test the agencies, find the weakest link mm. and who can get me the, uh, the lowest offer. And so. it is, then you end up with a battle on the property portals of one pricing it a little bit, you know, five dirhams cheaper than the other and um, exactly. it gets a bit yeah. silly. Um, okay, a lot of agents opening up their yep. own brokerages. What would your advice be to them? Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I, 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 look, ah, I, I wish everyone the best. And you know, mm. if, if you've got if you've got the drive and ambition to do that, all 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 uh, best wishes mm. to you. And um, I've got some very good friends who've done it and they've set up and they've mm. done very well. Um, I think you need to do it with your eyes open. Yeah. You know, you need to really understand the costs and the the other elements of, of setting up and running a business. It's um, not just a case of, oh, I'm going to get 100% commission. No, it's, you'll probably end up with exactly. 20% commission after if you that, paid everything. You know, yeah. If that. And I think, you know, I think also brokerages at the moment need to take a long-term view and they need to ensure that they are long-term financially stable. Yeah, I so, you know, we, we've had a couple of exceptional years, uh, 130,000 properties sold last year. It wasn't that long ago that we were seeing 25,000 mm. homes being mm. sold. And whilst I have no uh, expectation of us to go back there, of course, over the next few years, there will be good years and there'll be tougher years. And I mm. think anybody setting up a company needs to make sure that they set up a company that is robust enough to, to, handle, to, mm. to handle. And that, that frankly means there's a bit of meat on the bone. There's some margin in that business mm. that doesn't just... Uh, get you through the good years it also helps you get through the tough years Mm -hmm. and do you forecast that there's going to be you know similar to what's happening in the UK right now where all the independent agencies are being snapped up by the large corporates do you predict some kind of consolidation in the in the market um as we were talking about earlier I think during the tougher times yeah you have these consolidation periods and I think undoubtedly there are some brokerages out there today that will probably struggle when times mm. get a little bit tougher and there'll mm. be those opportunities. But this is, you know, this is a, an entrepreneurial town, right? Mm. Far more so than the UK. True. Uh, and I think that air of entrepreneurship over here, which I find infectious, I yeah. think is brilliant, will probably always keep it a slightly mm. more fractured market, certainly more so than we see in the UK. Yeah. Okay. Right. We asked Instagram yesterday. Well, we told Instagram that we're going to be sitting with you today. That's dangerous. And they have some questions <laughs> that on. they want your opinion on. All right, so we're going to kick off with the, this is an interesting one. How do you deal with toxic people in the industry? Okay, um, that's a really interesting one. I think the same way I deal with toxic people outside the industry. Everyone's allowed a good day and a bad day, right? Mm. And if you have a bad day, it doesn't mean you're a toxic person, but genuinely toxic people, mm. no time for them. Um, any advice for newbies? Uh, focus, mm-hmm. work hard, uh, don't get daunted, understand that those people are the top of the board, they're not superhuman, True. they've been through exactly the same challenges yeah. you're going through now and actually probably the most important thing is is stick with it. They kept on going. Keep going, okay. yeah. When will the market collapse? Or should there be if the market will collapse? Um, look, I, I, my answer to that is I don't think it will. Mm. Um, I think the market today is a very, very different beast to it was in 2008 and 2014. A lot more end users in the market, mm. a lot more real money rather than speculation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think Dubai itself and the UAE itself is a very, very different place. The momentum it has on a global level today yeah. is just night and day from where it was 15 yeah. years ago. So does that mean that I, the, there won't be slight ups and downs in the market? No, of course mm. there will. All markets go through slight ups and downs. Um, I think in a couple of years' time, there's a lot of inventory coming to the market yeah. and, and that might have an impact, certainly into rental prices, mm-hmm. which in itself is probably not a bad thing. It's probably healthy for rental mm-hmm. prices to come down a little bit anyway. Mm. Okay. Um, a switch here's someone who's switching or thinking about switching from off plan sales 
to ready sales. So yeah. it's an age, would you recommend that switching or stick with it? Um, it depends how they're doing it off plan sales. If they're making a lot <laughs> of money, like stick with it. Sounds like they're not making that yeah. much money. <laughs> clearly, clearly. <laughs> they are two quite different things, right? right? And they are yeah. two quite different skill sets. Uh, the key to successful, a successful end user is the relationship with the end user. So the, the ability to win and then manage listings mm is the key whereas obviously with the developer the, the developer takes all that side yeah, away yeah. from you um, but I've always and enjoyed doing, that you know, and doing viewings like and, and someone's going to have to teach you how to do a viewing teach you how to do a viewing yeah how to do a valuation mm -hmm. how to but you know if you like relationships long term relationships mm -hmm. from a dealing with a seller I think that's a, a great thing to get into what would you if you were like if you had to start your career all over again yeah. would you go into leasing off plan or sales in Dubai that's an interesting way. Look, I think most people would go into some sort of leasing role first Start anyway. Off with, mm -hmm. I think if they've never done it before, but mm -hmm. I would probably see myself more in the sort of secondary market sales okay. side. Yeah. But, you know. Because you like people. I like people. Um, and, oh, we've got... Off-plan's well, good fun as well, though, isn't it? You know, this yeah. Off-plan's good fun. It's a lot of numbers, though. You've got to be good at maths. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Think. Yeah. I'm right with maths. Um, this is a comment rather than a question. He's the best. Can't wait to tune into this one. <laughs> it's one of your ex-agents. Um, and, of course, everybody wants to know, well, this person wants to know, but I'm sure everybody wants to know how to make more money as a real estate broker. Of course they do. Uh, how to make more money as a real estate broker. There's only two things in your control. Mm -hmm. One is you and how hard you work and how much you learn and all the rest of it. And I guess the other side is the brokerage. You know, Are you in a platform that is giving you the best opportunity mm -hmm. to earn money? You can only look at those two things. Yeah. And if one of them is not working, do something about yeah. it. So pick one that's got exclusive projects. You've got to there ask more. Go. Like You've got to ask more questions when you're interviewing um at brokerages rather than how much what's the commission split because 70 percent of nothing is nothing look I, I i think you've got to find a brokerage that has an equitable commission split which mm -hmm. means you're making good money out of it but also is a brokerage that is investing in its marketing mm -hmm. it's investing in its infrastructure investing in things like projects, mm -hmm. investing in its future tech, so it's future-proofing itself mm -hmm. and make sure it's bringing tech to bear that's allowing you to do more business in the future. Mm -hmm. All those things cost money, so yeah. you know, you've know you got to, as you say, you've got to look a little mm -hmm. bit deeper, I think, than just the commission. And if I was going into an agency as, a, as an agent, I would choose an agency that does property management on a yep. large scale. And, you know, I, my past, any of the top agents had such a good relationship with the property management department because they know it it feeds it sales does, yeah. it, you know they're the kind of i'm not going to say babysitting the relationship but they're the ones that are uh retaining the client so it's kind of like having a library of upcoming or future listings so that would be my golden nugget choosing I an fully agency agree. and you know you've got what was it 7000 7, across the uae so We've got Good a few. going. Well, I think that's everything. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having <laughs> I've me. I've really enjoyed that. Kicking off the leader season, I think we've got into the secret sauce, um, lawn criminology, and uh, the golden F. Uh, the golden <laughs> F, or <laughs> the, the F word. Um, but yeah, thank you, Richard. It's been a pleasure. It's been a Thanks real pleasure. Me. And uh, thank you for joining us. Like, share, and subscribe. <laughs> Cheers guys, that thank really you very much, good. that was fun.